Welcome to Pace. Uh, that video was definitely me running. That that whole thing is just like me trying to like, um, Karma was like, what music should we put to that, that video this week? And I was like, we should put, do you remember, does anyone remember the beep test in high school? Okay, if, if, you've, if you've done the beep test, just raise your hand real quick. Okay, some of you know. Okay, if you're a little bit older, maybe you don't know this. This was the vein of my existence. I loved gym class because gym class was like an easy, easy A. You could get 100%. So all you have to do is show up and hit a volleyball. That's not hard. You don't have to even hit it over the net. You can just hit it into someone's face, and that's totally allowed. Like, it, you don't have to be good. You just have to show up. You got to try. You got to make sure you put deodorant on, because that'll for sure drop you, like, at least two grade points if you don't wear deodorant. But there was this awful test that would happen every single year, and it was called the beep test. And really what it is is, it sounds kind of weird, but you start off on one side of the gym, and then a beep goes off, beep, and then you run to the other side. And you have to make it to the other side before the next beep. And so it starts off really slow, beep, beep. And then by the end of it, it goes beep, beep, beep. And as soon as you miss a beep, you're out. And there, there would be this, you know, I don't know how to explain his, his voice, this man with a very deep voice going, level one, <laughs> level two. And I'm getting out at level five. And there's like six more levels. There's like, it goes up to I think 15 or something crazy. But the worst part, the worst part, okay, is I love the song, Eye of the Tiger. And that song is playing during the entire time in the beep test. Eye of the Tiger is the... And it's just like, and so you want to you wanna feel like as a guy, you're like, oh, this is my moment to show all the girls, like, I'm, I'm a man, Eye of the Tiger. And then you get 50% on the beep test. It's the worst. It's the worst. And so anyways, I was like, we were talking about pace, and we were talking about running, and and Carmen was like, what song can we pick? And I was like, let's get like a lo-fi version of Eye of the Tiger. That just sounds so, boom, 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 boom. Anyways, it'll be stuck in your head all, all week. Well, good morning during church. I'm so glad that you decided to be here on the final Sunday of 2023. You made it. You made it. Isn't that exciting? You made it. I love New Year's Eve because, uh, you know, it's a time of parties. And me, me and Carmen have been trying to figure out, we, we kind of want to be those like party people. Um, you know, I remember we wa- used to, I, I'm not, I don't know why I'm admitting this from the stage. We watched uh, <laughs> Keeping Up with the Kardashians one time. I watched it one time. And uh, Kanye and Kim, when they, were, when they were married, they would throw this like crazy Christmas party. And I remember turning to Karma, I was like, can we be like a certain holiday party people? Like, that like everybody knows you gotta be at the Sharda's house on Valentine's Day. No, no, not on Valentine's Day. But like, there's like a certain holidays that's like our celebr. like everybody knows you got to make that party. Um, and I think, honestly, I think it, I, want it, I want it to be New Year's. I think I kind of just decided that this year is, uh, we're not throwing a party. I'm not inviting anyone. To, okay, I'm just, it's not next year. This is my goal for 2024 is to host a New Year's Eve party next year. I have a whole year to plan it. It's going to be crazy. We're going to rent out the church and uh, it's going to be awesome. Um, it'll be great. But no, I, I, I love New Year's Eve because it's a time for us to look back at the year we've had and also, uh, like we mentioned in pre-service and like Pastor Jess mentioned, a, a time to look forward. Um, and today I want to begin talking about fine art. Oh, I can hear the excitement in the room. <laughs> it's amazing. I, I know you all look so excited, but maybe some of you are familiar with this piece of art. We're going to throw it up on the screen here. Does anyone recognize this piece of art? Okay, if, if you know it, does the camera just shout it out real quick? Starry Night, okay? It's one of the most famous fine art pieces uh, by Van Gogh. Um, I, it's not, I, know, I know for the people who actually go to art shows, that's not how you say his name, but I'm not, you know, that educated, so I'm just going to call him Van Gogh. Um, you know, and what's really interesting about this piece is it, it's about the Starry Night, um, but what I want to draw your attention to is something in the valley, uh, this town. You can see there's some homes, and you can see a church there. Do you guys all see that church in the valley? What's really interesting about Van Gogh's piece here is that there is lights on in all of the buildings except for one, the church. It's pretty interesting, hey? See, Van Gogh himself was pretty plagued in his search for God, and when I first saw this piece of art, I was taken aback by the incredible night sky, but 
The interesting part is why is there no lights on in the church? See, Van Gogh was actually the son of a pastor and he hated his father's belief. It created a deep, bitter animosity between the two of them. But before he became a painter, Van Gogh tried to become a pastor. And it wasn't until he failed as an evangelist that he actually began to dabble in painting. And at one time, he even said this, when I have the terrible need, shall I say the word, for religion, then I go out and paint the stars. What troubles me so much about this depiction is how true it is today in so many ways. See, a lot of people, they look at the church and they see beliefs and claims and words, and though they see, um, they see those things, they know that you know, we, we believe different, oftentimes they see lives without light. I think a lot of people recognize that uh, Christians believe something different, but their lives look as disordered and chaotic and frenzied as theirs do. And I'll be honest, I think sometimes they have a point. You know, something I've realized in my own life is that, and this is, you know, Jess kind of stole the thunder, is that theologically educated is not the same as being spiritually formed, right? Just because you know things about the Bible or about God doesn't mean that you've actually been formed spiritually. You know, I remember when I first became a Christian, I used to, I wanted to memorize things because I wanted to show off how much I knew about the Bible. So people would just like, we used to like do like little tests, me and my friend Hunter, like who could learn more about the Bible. And so, you know, uh, Romans 3.23, all men fall short of the glory of God. It's like the first like sin passage that talks about humanity. I remember we wanted to tithing. If I ever had to talk about tithing, Malachi 3.10, I was like, oh, that's a, that's a tithing passage. You know, and I, you know oh, there's all of these things. I remember trying to memorize my first pieces of scripture, James 1. You know, and how do I memorize this? Count it all joy, brothers and sisters, when you face trials of various kinds, for you know that, um, I have actually forgot it. Uh, (laughs) Anyways, but you get what I, I was trying really, really hard, right? I was trying really, really hard. Um, But all of that trying means nothing if you have spiritually not been formed, And I think that we have made a fatal assumption that as long as we get our thinking right, that our lives will just follow. And we put a lot of emphasis on things like worldview, and rightfully so, but it often comes at the cost of about 70 to 80% of what our lives are built around, which is habits. Duke University did a study years ago and they found that at least 40% of actions that we take are not the product of choice, but of habit. Uh, Some studies say as high as 80% of what we do is not our own choice, but it's the habits that we have. But at minimum, Duke, 40% of what you do is just the habits that you have. Poet and author uh, Annie Dillard said this, how we spend our days is of course how we spend our lives. We make our choices and then our choices make us. So the truth is, show me your habits and I'll show you your future. Good or bad, show me your habits and I will show you your future. And and the Bible uh, scripture, you know, surprisingly, or not surprisingly, has a lot to say about this concept. 2 Timothy 1.7, it'll be on the screen for you, says this, for the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Hebrews 12 says this, no discipline seems pleasant at the time. Can I get an amen? Amen. Thank you. Man, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. And so today I want to introduce you to our series called Pace. And our hope is that as we launch our new year with this new series, that it would set us all up to be able to run at a pace that is not only sustainable, but fruitful. We are going to center our time together around understanding and designing a personal rule of life. And if you don't know what that means, don't worry, we're going to uncover this over the next couple weeks. Um, And if you already have a rule of life, uh, this will be a great time to revisit it. 
and, and revise it and help others maybe design their own. Uh, here's a truth that I've learned is that when it comes to my life, if I live on autopilot, often my life treads towards chaos. It's just the truth. But with a godly understanding of discipline, God's will is to bring order to our lives. You know, I don't know how many of you uh, think about discipline. I would actually probably say I'm the most undisciplined person I know. Um, I hate discipline. I'm just going to be honest. Um, As I was prepping this message, I kept saying to Carm, I don't know why Jess is getting me to preach. I really suck at this. Um, You know, I'm the guy who signs up for a membership tomorrow. I've got my scheduled meeting um, <laughs> uh, for the gym and uh, not for Netflix. I know that's what you're thinking. No, no, no. Um, <laughs> for the gym. And then about, you know, March hits and I'm just like, ugh, I can't, I can't do it. I actually remember me and Abel started working out last December. We thought, hey, December 1st, we're, gonna, we're actually going to be a month before everyone else. We're going to start working out together. And I remember, I think it was Boxing Day. Do you remember this? It was 5 a.m. <laughs> He's like, no, I don't know. Boxing Day, or I think it was Christmas. I can't remember. It was somewhere around Christmas. And I remember it was like super cold. Like it was like the coldest day of the year. And I text Abel at like, what, it was like 4.48. I was up before you. I'm, not, I'm just saying. Anyways. Um, I'm like texting. I'm like, hey, can we, are you going to make it to the gym? And uh, he goes, nah, man. I, I, don't, I don't know if I can. I don't have the discipline like you do. I look up to you, brother. But I just, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's, I don't know if I have it in me today. And I said, listen, man, if we can go today, if we can go on the coldest day of the year, then we have no excuses any other day. We got to go today. So I got him out of bed, 5 a.m., 6 a.m., went to Anytime Fitness, Simons Valley, shout out. No one knows me there because I don't go there. <laughs> um, anyways, I went there one time. Um, we worked out, and I was like, yeah, doesn't this feel good? And he's like, yeah. And I'm pretty sure that was the last time we went. <laughs> Like, it was like, it was the hardest time to go, and we're like, man, we've reached the pinnacle of working out on the coldest day of the year. Why even go the rest of the year? And I'm pretty sure that was the last time. It was crazy. (laughs) But here's what I want to do today, okay? This isn't just about working out and and having good habits. Uh, Really, you know, what we want to talk about today is what is a rule of life, Uh, why do we need it, and how do we live it? Really, that's what we're going to talk about. And we're going to start off in Matthew chapter 9. And I'm starting you off in the middle of the passage. So if you're a little bit confused, don't worry. We're going to to round things out a little bit. But this is uh, Jesus' words, what he says. He says, Neither do people pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the skins will burst. The wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins so that both are preserved. So according to Jesus, if we fail to perceive, one, what God is doing in our time, and then two, the proper container of holding the outward blessing of God, the result is a double loss. The wine is spilled, meaning the gift uh, of God's presence and power uh, for his people is wasted. And then secondly, the wineskins burst. The container for holding God's blessing at a previous time that was useful then is left tattered and broken by this new one. And I remember, you know, coming to church for the first time, I was really confused about this passage for a real, I'm like, new wineskins? People don't even let you drink as a Christian. What are you talking about? Like, I was like, what is that? Like, the church I was at was just a little bit more fundamentalist. And, and I remember just like, I don't understand. I don't get this new wine, wineskins. What, what does this all mean? And so I know it can be a little bit confusing, but maybe this story will help you. See, there was a young Christ follower who had converted from Islam uh, and began to lead a Bible study among his friends. And he led hundreds, literally hundreds uh, of people to Jesus. And then this group began to grow and meet together and there was something of like the book of Acts type story unfolding among them. Uh, And then there was this really well-intentioned pastor from the same town that got involved and he tried to tame some of that wild commitment to Jesus uh, and save these people from the ills of following Jesus unaided by the help of a professional. Interesting. And so he offered them space to bring their faith into a home group structure of his church. And when he tried to fit these couple hundred Muslim converts into his church, 
uh, church's small group structure, the momentum stopped, the young leaders were sidelined, and within a year, the vast majority of those young Christians had left the faith altogether. See, by trying to fit new wine into an old wineskin, the wine was spilled, the skins were burst. It hurt the fresh thing that God was doing, and it hurt the local church and the faithful members of those small groups. Do you see it? You don't put new wine in old wine skits. And this is what Jesus cautioned us against. But unlike some of Jesus' teachings, you know, it wasn't like a clever parable or a formal sermon. Jesus said this in response to a question. The reason he's talking about wineskins is because somebody had asked him a question. This is what we're going to see in Matthew 9, 14 on the screen here. Then John's disciples, John's disciples came and asked him, how is it that we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? In other words, we don't recognize the expression of your spirituality. What is your covenant? What are your vows? Uh, these are the disciples of John the Baptist, okay? They're asking their friends. These are not, um, you know, opponents who are angry at Jesus. No, 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 these are his friends. And they're asking him something along the lines of like, we like your vision. You know, we like the direction you're going. We like your wine. What's your wineskin? What's your wineskin? See, the central conflict between Jesus and the Pharisees um, centered around wineskins. And if we think about it, you know, I actually, there's a lot in common on the surface. See, there was a desire uh, for the kingdom of God, a commitment to holy living, a reverence for scripture and the history of God's people. Uh, you know, there was vision and there, there were so many parallels with that vision, but here was the difference, the vow the way that they lived that vision continuously was miles apart. The Pharisees added to the law and they fenced the Torah. And so Jesus is on the other side and said, look, I'm not here to abolish the law and the prophets, I'm here to fulfill them. And then how did he fulfill them? Through his life, death, and resurrection. Grace is the new wineskin that holds this new wine and a new vow to express this vision. Dietrich Bonhoeffer famously, when uh, officiating a wedding, offered this piece of advice to a young couple. He says, today you are young and very much in love, and you think that your love can sustain your marriage. It can't. Let your marriage sustain your love. So Bonhoeffer is looking at this young couple with a fire of love in their hearts, and, and they're standing, looking at each other, thinking no, nothing else it matters except for this person in front of me. Every other plan, every other idea that I had does not matter. What matters is, is the person in front of me. And everything else is taking a back seat. And Bonhoeffer is saying something like this. I love the vision. And I've seen that you, you really believe it. You want to be together. But he says, if you really want it, you're going to need a vow. See, vows are the container that holds the vision and a place where it can flourish. They're like a proper pot for a plant. And with the right soil and the right amount of space for the roots uh, to grow, the right container where a seed can become its full potential. It means, it's the means by which we give God more of the only thing that we have to give. We don't have much, but what we can give is more of ourselves more space within our inner lives, a vow, or in another way of calling it a rule of life, um, it ne it's a never a means to make God love you more or to prove your commitment to him. It's a means by which we give God more of us to work with. It's love, not legalism or fear that drives a groom to make vows to his bride or for a bride to make bows to her groom. It's love, love always, and love only that drives us to make vows to God. The psalmist wrote it uh, in Psalm 56 like this. Let's take a look. This is what he says. I'm under vows to you, my God. 
I will present my thank offerings to you, for you have delivered me from death and my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before God in the light of life, under vows. Vows are the way that we learned to live in the promised land when we've only ever known Egypt. You know, we talked about that at pre-service prayer today, if you were here. I want to encourage you, come to that. You know, I, I find myself showing up early and, and just praying, man, it just does something. It just makes it that much sweeter. Sundays are just that much sweeter when I get an early start. But vows are, are how we do that. It's how we can come from Egypt and, and look to the promised land. And so at this moment, we find ourselves uh, in this new vision, an ancient one. And, and, and we want to ask, how is our vow going? The ancient practice of a rule of life, it's the container that will allow this vision to flourish. So that brings us to what is a rule of life? Andy Crouch defines a rule of life as a set of practices to guard our habits and to guide our lives. That's what a rule of life is. Some history for you. A rule of life, uh, really, if we trace it back to its origins, started um, about 300 years. Um, it, it does trace back further, but really, uh, the Roman Empire was at its uh, highest, and Christianity had almost become kind of a part of the culture. And people, you know, think of Texas, okay? Everybody was just Christian. Everybody's just Christian. You go there, you have a pistol, and you have your Bible. That's just like... They make holsters for that. I don't know if you can go online, you can find, you can find a, a Bible holster and a pistol holster in the state. It's incredible. But like Christianity just became a part of the culture. And so everyone, you know, not everyone, there was still persecution, don't get me wrong, but it was just, it, it became a part of the culture and the people just became a little bit more nominal, you know? And there was this movement that started called the Desert Fathers and Mothers. And if you come from a Catholic tradition, you probably have heard about some of these people. But the father, uh, sorry, the Desert Fathers and Mothers were like these hermits, okay? It's really where the start of these like monasteries began, was that they went out to the desert, they left the city and all the sins and vices and everything there, they went out to the desert and just began to work on their disciplines. And that's really where you start to see the renewal movements of our faith at the beginning, um, when you start to see people get really back into God's word and begin to be become renewed, and you see huge movements of gods that are traced back to this moment of the desert fathers and mothers. But really, the question is, is why do we do it? Why do we have a rule of life? I mean, this is the, the picture I want to paint for you today. Uh, your spiritual life is like a garden, okay? Picture it like a garden. I know many of you don't garden. Who gardens in here? Can I see my people? Okay, now I know I can get you to do my garden. This is perfect, okay. Um, like I, don't, I don't garden either. Um, but your spiritual life is a garden. And we do a really good job of getting rid of weeds, but often not a great job of planting practices and disciplines that will lead to creating a lush garden. See, it's not enough for you to come to church and go, you know what, I used to do these old things. You know, I used to smoke weed on the weekends, and now I only do it once a month. You know, or you shouldn't do it at all. But, you know, we, we try to get rid of the weeds in our lives, right? The things that we all know, oh, you probably shouldn't be doing that. You probably shouldn't be doing that, right? But often we forget to plant the seeds of how we can live in habit that will grow a lush garden. Does that make sense? So it's not enough just to get rid of your weeds. You need a garden. You need to plant seeds of discipline and habit in your life. And I'm preaching to me here, okay? Okay. Because like I said, I, I struggle with discipline here. I'm, I'm, I'm very undisciplined. And so we need to do that. And so just humor me with this exercise. Okay, I want you to just close your eyes real quick, everybody. Just close your eyes with me. Okay, and picture the person that you admire the most. Someone in your life that just pulls kind of like the holiness out of you just by their presence. When they're around you, it draws the best version of yourself to the surface. What is it about them? How do you feel when you're around them? What does their presence communicate? What does their life say? And now, picture yourself at 80. 
And if you're pitch, if you're 80, pitch yourself at 90. <laughs> Who do you want to be? How do you want the people around you to feel when they're around you? What do you want to pull to the surface? What does your presence communicate? What does your life say? And then finally, here's the question probably worth spending a bit of time on. Is how you're living today taking you where you want to go? You can open your eyes. And, I, and what I'm talking about is, is your morning routine, your work hours, your weekend plans, your spiritual practices, your habits, everything from the way you spend your first 15 minutes of your morning to your diet, to your typical weekday and evening, your attention, your media consumption, your reading, your listening, your free devotion time, your imagination. Is all of it taking you there? Are your practices aimed directly at what Aristotle called your telos? The thing that you're aiming towards. You know, just an interesting point. You know, Jesus mentions in the Bible, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And what he's saying to us in that moment is, I'm your telos. I'm the thing that you should be aiming for. I'm the thing. Be like me. And maybe an even more important question than where is your rule of life taking you is what is it doing to you along the way? Because there is no neutral in this world. You are being formed right now. There is only intentional spiritual formation and unintentional spiritual formation. So is the way that you're living forming you into what you want to become? Or is there a gap? Maybe a huge gap, a giant wall in front of you of who you want to become. The truth that I'm trying to get to you right now is this. You already have a rule of life. Written or unwritten. Chosen by you or chosen for you. Conscious or unconscious. Based on the kind of person that you want to grow into or based on the over-promising, under-delivering pleasure that you want to feel. The question isn't, do you have a rule of life? The question is, do you know what your rule of life is? Because whatever is at the center for you, it isn't only taking you somewhere, it's forming you into the image of whatever it is. So I'm not suggesting a new spiritual practice. I'm suggesting attention and intention where you might have been inattentive and unintentional. And that's one of the core problems that we as humans have is that our habits are forming us no matter what. You don't gotta try. Your habits right now are making you into somebody. Now you can choose to be intentional with those habits or you can stay unintentional. Either way, you're gonna become formed into something. Every last one of us. And we really mean to be kind and present and easygoing and that perfect balance of you know, driven and relational. And every one of us will wake up one day discovering that we have become a certain kind of friend, a certain kind of spouse, a certain kind of parent, a certain kind of child, a certain kind of pastor. And there's a gap between who I intend to be and who I really am. And that's where the rule of life lives, right in the gap between intention and action. And so how do we do it? How do we, how do we set up these rules of life? You know, I, for me, it's, it's a once a month meeting with my friend James. And uh, we both pastors here in the city. And he is somebody that I will tell everything and anything to. And I'm that person for him as well. And we go to Chipotle or sometimes if we're kind of trying to save some money, we go to McDonald's. Oh, man, I feel so exposed right now. And we, uh, and we share our life. And he says, how are you as a father? Are you being the father that you want to be this month? And often it's, no, I'm not. 
I'm not being the father that I want to be. And uh, where I want to end today is uh, just a thought. You know, over the next four weeks, Pastor Jess is really going to take us deep in this, in this idea of rule of life and, and how we can create rhythms and practices. Um, and I did this last September, was when I, when I really started to look at my rule of life. And, and we don't like that word rules, right? But really, uh, that's just, <laughs> I, just want you to, I just want to say, just, just chill out. Okay, we're not, it's not like rules, right? It's not like laws. These are things to like help us. And when I started doing this, there was one practice that I found very, very helpful in my process of trying to figure out how do I create a rule of life for myself? What are the habits? And, and some of these things can be really, really easy, okay? Like for me, I get home, and, and it's not every, every day, but after probably about six o'clock, you can call me all you want, but you probably will not reach me. Um, you know, there's a few people, Pastor Jess, there's, I've got like favorite, you know those favorite people on your messages? Um, there's only a couple of them. But those are the people that can get through the do not disturb feature on my phone. There's only a few people who can reach me after 6 p.m. Um, in case of emergencies. But that's time that I want with my family and with my kids. And so I realize that the thing that's forming me the most is this. It's often this. This is like a, a, a box that just like destroys me because I'll have my son saying, Dad, Dad, can we play? And I go, one sec. And my thumb just keeps doing this. And so I decided last September, I'm going to change. I can't do this anymore. I don't want to be a father like that. And so I just said, no, I'm, I'm going to try as much as I can. My phone goes on my charger, and you're not going to get a hold of me. I'm sorry. Unless you call Pastor Jess, and then she'll call me. So then, <laughs> then you can get a hold of me. Um, or my wife. There's a couple other people in there. Um, but what I want to finish off with is I did this practice last September and I, I know this is New Year's Eve, okay, and you were thinking you're coming to church and it's supposed to be like this encouraging message about New Year's, new me, ah. Yeah, you know, and uh, there's this verse that I want to read and I, I really hope it's encouraging to you. Let's take a look at Ecclesiastes. Can you pull that up for me real quick? Is that up on the screen? This is what it says. Okay. It is better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting. For death is the destiny of everyone. The living should take this to heart. And there's your New Year's scripture for you to take. <laughs> there it is. Take it with you. I know it's good. I know it's so good. I, we were actually thinking about making shirts for everyone today and we could hand them out at the end. Just that it would just be the perfect, looks great on a cup. It's better for you to go to a house of mourning. Maybe... The Bible doesn't do it for you, but here's what Steve Jobs said. Take a look at this quote. Remembering that I'll be dead soon is the most important tool I've ever encountered to help me make big choices in life. Because almost everything, all external expectations, all pride, all fear of embarrassment or failure, these things just fall away in the face of death, leaving only what is truly important. And so last September, I did something. Is I decided to write my eulogy um, from the point of view of my wife on the things that I would want her to say to me. Okay? Now this is, I know I'm getting, this is a great New Year's Eve message. <laughs> Jess, it's okay if I don't preach for another six months. I'm good, <laughs> just so you know. Um, but I did this practice of writing my eulogy in the perspective of the person that when I closed my eyes, I saw and that was my wife. And she pulls the best person out of me, uh, like, like no one else can. And uh, I'm going to be a little bit vulnerable today and uh, talk to you about eulogy virtues and resume virtues. Uh, see, resume virtues are the skills you bring to the marketplace. The eulogy virtues are the ones that are talked about at your funeral. Whether you were kind, brave, honest, or faithful, were you capable of deep love, we all know that the eulogy virtues are the more important ones than your resume virtues. You know, I'm glad that you are the top salesman in your field. But listen, your kid's not going to get up at your funeral and go, you know what I really love about my dad? 
He was, he, he was the top salesman in his fields. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think he's going to say that, or she. And uh, what I want to do today, and I know this is, I know it's a weird New Year's Eve message, but I have to be faithful to what God's called me to do. Okay, this isn't, this isn't comfortable for me. It's actually really hard. Um, and so I want to just read uh, the eulogy that I wrote for myself from the perspective of my wife. And I really feel like this is the way that this Pace series could really make a difference in your life. When you begin to picture the person that you want to be at the end of your life, that's the only way that you can really set up rules of life to help get you there. You need to be in that headspace. And I know it's weird on New Year's Eve. You're like, why are we talking about death on New Year's Eve? It's a weird church. I agree with you. We are weird. Okay? <laughs> it's weird. But I want you to ask yourself, Okay, with your present trajectory in life, would people, what kind of things would people say about you compared to your current reality and preferred future? Consider the gaps and the adjustments, okay? And I'm just gonna read my eulogy, and I've never read this. Um, I shared this with a couple of people, but uh, I, it's, yeah, here we go. This is how Carmen, would, I think, would start my eulogy. Harmon would hate that he's not here right now. All his friends and family gathered, all the people and extrovert knew all in one room ready to hang out. My husband lived his life with two purposes, to chase after God with everything that he has and to chase after people. And if he was here right now, he would be asking everyone, what is God doing in your life? He would be asking, sorry, I can't read my notes because my eyes are weirdly watering. <laughs> sorry. If he was here right now, he would be asking everyone, what is God doing in your life and how are you seeing God move in your life? He spent his entire life dedicated to the mission of God and that's how many of you know him. You heard him preach or teach or knew he was a pastor and today I will let you in and show you the man he was to his family. Although Harm was passionate about the church and God, it was also his mission to never let the demands of ministry overtake his call to be a husband and a father. There's nothing in this world he loved more than me and our children. He spent his life showcasing the love of Christ to us. He was someone who served us daily, someone who took out the trash even though we equally hated doing it. He would lay and wrestle with his boys for hours. My sons are the men of God that they are because of the humility and kindness that their father displayed. He was tender and tough as a father. He never let them lower their worth, but always told them to walk in humility. He displayed for them what means to be a man, what it means to be a man who has counted the cost of following Christ. And he walked it through. My children love the Lord, and he played the biggest part in them finding Christ. He showed them in the face of deep persecution to forgive people because they know not what they do. He showed us that even when your own family might not support you for following Jesus, that Jesus is the most important, to follow him anyways. He was gentle, an example to, uh, to us of what a transformed life looks like in Christ, and he gave his life for the kingdom. He is the man that loved me for the seven, the past seven decades. I'm kind of prophesying in this at the same time. <laughs> Never wavering in his devotion to me, he loved me like Christ loved the church. He championed me into the pastor I am today. He never let me think that I couldn't do anything because I was a woman in ministry. He helped me break every glass ceiling and even have love for those who put them there in the first place. He saw the best in everyone. Even when people didn't have good intentions towards him, he always assumed positive intent. He gave people the benefit of the doubt when they wanted to do nothing but harm him. That's who he was. He saw the best in everyone. And not only that, but he challenged you to see the best in yourself and then demanded that you live up to that. He was his, his own harshest critic, but eventually found a way to see himself how I did that he didn't let his insecurities consume him, he overcame them and lived with confidence in Christ and who Christ has made him to be. He didn't let the perceptions of others cripple his mind, but learned that he was, 
that through the still small voice that he was refining him slowly. He would also be mad that he doesn't get to preach today. He honed that craft that God gifted him with daily and he wanted a chance to show everyone in the room how much he's grown. He made his mentors proud. He made his sons proud. He has made me proud. And most importantly today, he stands in heaven with Jesus, probably preaching to him as he's calling and saying to him, well done, good and faithful servant. There's some more in there, but it's a little, it gets super personal, so I won't read the rest. Oh, man, I hate crying. See, there's two things that really struck me when I did this as an exercise. One was how much I realized my wife, how she sees me already. But what was really crippling to me was that my life was not set up in a way for her to be able to say those words when I die. And it took the rule of life, and it took me going, I need to change my habits. I need to change my ways for me to be able to become the person that she talks about at my funeral. So we're New Year's Eve, come on. It's great. I wanna leave you with, with this. Over the next week, at some point, before next Sunday when Pastor Jess preaches, I want you to write your eulogy, okay? I know this is, you hate getting homework, me too, but uh, I got the mic, so it sucks for you. Um, I want you to write your eulogy and uh, do it by yourself, do it alone, and, and, and at first it might just start off with characteristics of what you think you'd want people to say, you know, how would, how would you want them to describe you? And then I want you to close your eyes and think of that person that's gonna be speaking at your funeral. And then I want you to go through this exercise before we get to next week, before we really dive into the rule of life and how we can really set ourselves up for success. And ask yourself, is the person that I am today the person that I wanna become? And for me, it, it took once. One time in my life now is just, I read this, okay? And it's gonna, it's gonna sound weird. I tried to read this, read this once a month just to remind myself, okay, who, who am I being? Who, who's the person that, I, that I'm trying to become? Once a month, I know it sounds morbid, but I do it. And this year, this year could be different for you. This year really could be different. You know, I hated the feeling of waking up one day going, man, how did I get here? I don't even know how who I am, how I've I've become who I am. I've never been intentional with my habits. I've never been intentional with the way that I walk with the Lord. And I really want to encourage you. God can do something amazing in your life if you allow yourself to open up your heart and allow him to speak. And so I'm going to let Pastor Abel, your timing was perfect today, by the way. I just want to say that. I'm just kidding. Great job, man. Um, Inside joke, if you weren't here three months ago, it's, it's all good. Um, but I just want him to sing that, that song over us, Lord, Send Revival, because I really believe God's gonna do it. If you ask him, God, I, I need a revival in my heart. I don't wanna be the person that I've always been. I wanna become who you've called me to become. And just as you sit, just, just sit down. You don't have to stand. And just take that song in while he sings that. And then Pastor Dave um, is gonna come up and close.